broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hello everyone, warm welcome from Kuala Lumpur. This is the ABU World Lab three part webinar series on DAB plus digital radio technology implementation and rollout. This series will provide expert knowledge and information on the current status of DAB plus digital radio technology, business case, DAB receivers, head end systems, transmission systems, RF network design, and sharing of some experiences of DAB plus trial implementation. Uh, before we move up, Move on with today's presentation. Uh, just a short housekeeping announcement as usual for the benefit of those who may be joining us for the first time on GoToWebinar platform. Uh, just a quick note on using the webinar control panel to send in your question. As you can see on the slide, please type your questions in the Q&A tab and keep sending them to us as and when you have while the presentation is going on. We will take the questions at the end during Q&A session. And finally, for your information, we'll be sharing the presentation slides after the webinar series by email. Uh, today is the first day on this uh, webinar series. Uh, we have uh, multiple multi-speaker presentation for today, and the topics are uh, and the topics are DAB plus overview and business case. Uh, to highlight today's program and the moderation of the day's session, I would like to request Dr. Les Savile to take the control for the next 20, 90 minutes. Uh, he is a key member of the World Lab Technical Committee and a principal speaker as well. Uh, with that, please allow me to pass the control to Les. Um, uh, Les, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Greg. I You're hope right. everyone can see that. So, yeah, so well, I'd, I'd give my welcome remark too. Thank you very much for attending this, this uh, webinar series. Uh, we have a great panel today uh, talking about uh, the business side of World DAB and uh, DAB Plus implementation. So our speakers today are Joan Warner, who's the CEO of Commercial Radio Australia and also the chair of the Asia Pacific Committee for World DAB. Uh, we have myself, uh, we have Adam Willis-Croft, who's the content director of HIT and Triple M Networks at, uh, at Southern Cross Austeria in Australia, and also uh, Adam Bolton, who's the head of the Arabic 24 uh, DAB Plus channel with the special broadcasting service. So we have a whole range of good and interesting topics today about the business side of DAB. So with that uh, opening, I would like to now uh, uh, present uh, 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 Nadine. I think Nadine's going to give us a couple of remarks and then we'll move on to, to Joan, uh, who will give her remarks and then start the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Les. Uh, thank Nadine. you for that uh, quick introduction. Just uh, uh, wanted to say a welcome from Kuala Lumpur and ABU uh, uh, for everyone who are joining us for this three-day webinar series. This is a joint collaboration between ABU and the World DAB. Uh, the idea for the next three days is to provide you with the necessary and relevant information about uh, the DAB Plus technology, uh, how you can go about implementing it, uh, where to look for if you want help, for example. Most of the speakers uh, joining us in the next three days will be able to help you uh, of course, uh, World DAB is very strong uh, in Australia, so uh, Les and colleagues will be able to share uh, some relevant case studies, uh, how it is doing, uh, what are the technologies involved, how easy or difficult it is to implement, and especially one uh, very important thing, which is about the receivers. I think when it comes to uh, digital radio, a lot of uh, the broadcasters in the region have this question about receivers, but I think uh, when it comes to DAB Plus and DAB Plus, uh, how, how well it is, taken up by Europe and a um, uh, large part of Asia now. Uh, receivers is not a problem. I think you're going to hear this uh, from multiple speakers today and the next two days. So just uh, a warm welcome to all of you. And with that short remark, I will just pass it to uh, Les for him to continue with the session. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine. That's, uh, that's great. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so yes, now uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Joan Warner. 
uh, the chair of the Asia Pacific Committee for uh, her remarks and uh, opening on what the status of DAB is in this region and around the world. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Les. Um, hello, everybody. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, just need to expand, so I just expand it there. Uh, it's not quite full screen. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. We're on. Okay. Now I'll just. Uh, I'll just open by saying thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Um, it is an important topic and certainly the future of radio is an important topic. It will be nice when we can all get together in person again, as we did on a number of occasions over the past few years to talk about not only DAB, but about radio in general. Um, we are at a difficult time for uh, radio broadcasters in this... How do I move that on? Okay, we're at a difficult time. We've all had a tough year, I think, and certainly here in Australia, we've seen quite a big impact um, of COVID-19 on our uh, revenues, but interestingly, not on our listenership. Our listenership has gone up during the COVID crisis. But there's no doubt that all over the world, we're all facing conditions that are challenging. We're being challenged on our strategy and certainly, as I've said, on our revenue. The continued evolution of radio is now happening as a part of a dynamic period of change as we see listener behaviour change as well. The effect of this time of challenges and disruption can't be overlooked, but it's also reinforced radio's important role in our communities and the strength of its unique offerings. DAB plus digital radio is about planning for a sustainable broadcast future for radio and for our industry as a whole, particularly in light of ongoing global crises and the more anticipated threats from large global digital platforms. Yes, the industry is going through an unprecedented time and we can't argue that, but there will always be a place for radio and its audio ecosystem in our communities. Through remaining committed to the implementation and rollout of DAB digital radio in our region, as well as the development of DAB technology, we're taking vital steps towards growth and cost-effective longevity. Today and the next couple of days is an opportunity for us to celebrate the benefits of DAB. I hope we can also use it as a time to reconnect, refocus and continue the momentum and progress that we are seeing across much of the world while reigniting movement and ideas where they might have stalled. I look forward to hearing from everyone speaking today and to our discussions continuing on beyond this webinar. Around the world, DAB plus digital radio is still making significant progress, even in spite of the hurdles that we've had to cope with. And I'd like to continue on here now, uh, just with an update on some developments for the status of DAB around the world. I'm just hearing Nadim talk about receivers. There are over 93 million DAB receivers, consumer and automotive, have been sold, up from 82 million one year ago. Over 531 million people are within reach of a DAB signal. And DAB is now available in 43 countries and territories. When we just have uh, a little bit of a look at uh, the DAB factory settings for cars, for example, the number of new cars produced with DAB as a factory fit, Norway is leading the way with 100%, followed closely by Switzerland, the UK. Australia's up at 75% of all new cars coming off the assembly lines are factory fitted with DAB+. Now, of course, we all know that a high level of listening takes place in cars. So the car situation is very important for any new technology and especially for a digital technology. When we look at cumulative receiver sales, and again, that's that important receiver issue, and why is it important to see such big numbers? So 
quarter two, two, 2008 to quarter two 2020, UK has now got nearly 45 million receivers in the market. Germany, 17 million. Norway, 7 million. Australia coming up pretty close behind that with nearly seven, a little over 6 million. And you can see the other countries. Now, why is it important to show you these figures? Well, it's important because it shows you that there will be a range of receivers available for any jurisdiction that goes DAB, not only in cars, but also standalone receivers. And of course, the more countries that turn on DAB, DAB Plus, the more cars that come off the assembly line, the more receivers that are produced, the cheaper those receivers become. And I think for some jurisdictions, certainly for Australia, that was a very important consideration. When we have a look at the coverage, you can see again, very impressive results. Denmark nearly at 100%, Norway nearly 100, Switzerland nearly 100 in terms of population coverage. Australia, we're at 64, but we do have a very big country. We've covered our biggest cities and we're just about to start roll out plans for the next range of regional cities around the country. Household receiver penetration, so that's not including cars. You can see it's quite high where a household has a DAB radio. Norway is very high, UK, of course. Australia doing pretty well at 51%, and other countries are starting to make inroads. In Europe, we see lots of regulatory developments that are important to the ongoing development and rollout of DAB. Uh, as you can see, I'll just go through a headline point for each country. Germany has just launched a second national commercial multiplex. France has launched a national multiplex plan for 2021 covering Paris, Marseille. Italy has three national multiplexes and 20 local multiplexes on air. The UK government is conducting a digital radio and audio review due out, I believe, in March 2021. Switzerland are talking about an FM phase out in 22-23. Norway, of course, we all know, switched off their national FM services in 2017. And very importantly, when we look at a country that has switched off its analog services, DAB listening levels, levels are now at similar levels to before the FM switch off. There was a little bit of concern when the levels dropped a little bit as people changed over their uh, radio receivers, but now listening levels are back to what they were when FM was the main form of broadcast. The Netherlands, they've got the regional network growing with 10 local marxists and 40 plus stations on air, and they're also talking about a new national DAB plus multiplex. We go to Belgium now, we've got DAB plus campaigns taking place across the country. We've got Swedish radio applying for nationwide DAB plus licenses, 20 to 25. The Czech Republic has four network operators and one national multiplex on air. Uh, and in September this year, several DAB plus transmitters launched, bringing the population coverage to 98%. Poland, over 25, DAB plus services across the country with population coverage to grow to nearly 82% in a couple of years. Austria have now got population coverage of nearly 84%. Croatia have stations broadcasting in a DAB trial. And in Spain, we've got 18 regular services on air, reaching at this point in time only 20% of the population, but we have another 17 regions talking about the launch of DAB plus services. We'll go to Eastern Europe now, and you can see that uh, there is regular DAB plus services on air across a number of these countries, as well as trials in other countries. So as you can see just from the map of Europe, we are seeing a lot of progress being made, not only in deployment planning and permanent services, but trials that uh, if any other country is an example, uh, Australia started with a trial and then of course went to permanent services. When we look at some other areas of the world, Tunisia has 75% population coverage. Algeria has a DAB trial launched in 2018 and that is still ongoing. South Africa has a DAB trial in Johannesburg covering 21% of the population and the trial license has been extended to Cape Town. Middle East, we've got DAB receiver specifications published in the United Arab Emirates, a trial launched in July 2019 in Qatar, and another launched in Oman. We've also got five DAB services on air in Jordan. 
So while I'm not going to go through every point, and, I, and these presentations will be made available after the webinar has uh, the three days is finished, but you can see just how quickly DAB is being taken up as the digital radio broadcast technology of choice around the world. So let's come back to our own region, the Asia Pacific. There are a couple of uh, very important countries that are progressing very rapidly. Thailand, who you will hear about uh, during the three-day webinar. Uh, the Bangkok DAB trial continues with the MBTC championing the DAB rollout. 20 month, uh, 20 month trial commenced in April 2019 and the MBTC planned to extend the DAB trial in Bangkok for a further three years. Full national coverage for Thailand planning has been completed. Vietnam, they've got a trial on air in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City. Trials are made up of 16 different channels. The trial will be evaluated this year and recommendations will be submitted to government in 2021. World Jab is still working very closely with Malaysia on getting the DAB plus standard adopted as the major digital radio standard for Malaysia. And there's a lot of interest uh, amongst broadcasters, public and private, and, and with the regulator in Malaysia. The New Zealand Radio Broadcasters Association is over the next year or two having a look at where they wish to go with digital radio, and of course, are looking to Australia. There are some other countries, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and Laos, with whom World Dab has been working over the years, but there are no new updates or progress on what is happening in those countries for this webinar. I'm uh, very happy to talk about a new service or support group that World Dab is setting up specifically for the Asia Pacific region. It's going to be dedicated to assisting the broadcast industry, both private broadcasters and public service broadcasters in this region to implement DAB and help keep activities aligned with DAB standards. There'll be a number of opportunities per year for people to come together, hopefully in person uh, after this year, but otherwise certainly via webinars to discuss, learn and collaborate on all the technical aspects of DAB with information tailored to a particular region or country. Now, Anyone can participate in this support group, broadcasters, public and commercial, governments, regulatory bodies, network providers, equipment and receiver manufacturers. What we'll be covering will be RF coverage planning, which of course is key to making sure your DAB services are successful, interference analysis, field testing, rollout strategies, network design and operation. And as I said earlier, uh, we would be trying to meet two to four times a year, including at least one physical meeting. And the purpose of this is to make available all the resources uh, that World Dab can offer to broadcasters and regulators in this region who are interested uh, in rolling out World Dab. And the resources that each uh, country may need may not be the same. Some countries may need uh, assistance with coverage planning. Some may need interference analysis. Some may need some work on the technical business case. All of these types of support are available. Just uh, all you need to do is contact World DAB Project Office and a tailored program will be developed for your country or for your network. Now, that just about brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. I will just talk quickly about DAB in Australia because uh, there has been quite a lot happening. As I said earlier, 75% of new cars are now sold with DAB up from 60% a couple of years ago. We've got coverage of 64% of the population. We've got over 6 million DAB plus enabled devices sold in the country, all at different price points. There are some quite expensive DAB receivers, but there are also some quite cheap DAB receivers. In fact, at the Aldi supermarkets, uh, I think last Christmas, they were selling a very simple DAB plus receiver for about $15 Australian. Now, our latest rating survey here in this country show that over 30% of all people listen to DAB+. Now, that is probably three times as high as the number of people listening to radio via streaming. So DAB uh, has got a very firm foothold in this country. And our next task, of course, is to roll it out into regional areas. Permanent DAB services are on air here in nine markets. 
The 10th market, the Gold Coast, which is a very large regional population centre, will be rolling out next year. Uh, and there are 15 other priority markets that have been identified by our broadcasters. We've got now more than 350 Australian AM, FM and DAB plus stations easily available via voice through our radio app on Google Nest speakers, thanks to a partnership we have with Google. And our first major highway tunnel, which was a big step forward for DAB in Australia to support DAB, the M4 in Sydney, opened in August 2019. Legislation in this state requires all new tunnels to have DAB+, which is, again, another very big support from the local government in terms of DAB+, in Australia. Well, looking ahead, just to finish up my um, small section at the moment, as I said earlier, uncertainty and disruption are everywhere in the current climate, but radio's role is more relevant than ever. We are more important than ever before. We have to see the value in embracing innovations in audio and not forget DAB plus digital radio's place in the wider multi-platform audio landscape, not to mention it is a much lower cost to operate than AM and FM. We must remain champions of radio and audio, and in particular celebrate the variety of DAB plus attributes that we know make it a valuable investment for listeners, broadcasters and advertisers. Ongoing education of listeners and the market are also key, and also ongoing discussions with governments so that they know what the industry wants and how they need the government to support us in terms of policy for DAB and also making spectrum available. A commitment by broadcasters across regions to work together and invest in DAB will see increased support from governments. Sometimes governments are just waiting to hear what the broadcasters want, and the broadcasters are waiting to hear what the government wants. And sometimes they really don't end up talking. What we found in Australia is that the industry got together, spoke to the government and said, we definitely want DAB+. And we were then given the assistance from government to start rolling out. Investment in policy and regulation will support us. But we also do need to do the research into what listeners want and to how they enjoy all the different facets of DAB. So what we're doing right, right now here in this webinar, ongoing collaboration with broadcasters, uh, regulators, network providers, equipment suppliers around the world through open sharing of resources and information is key, not just at a local or national level, but on this regional and global level that we are now working at. By doing this, we'll all be well equipped to promote DAB evolve digital radio capabilities and make sure we have a cost efficient, cost effective broadcast solution in DAB to go forward with our digital solutions for radio. So that's all from me for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. That's great. That's a really good overview of where we are today. Um, I, I think it is a, bit, it's a real indicator, as we see in Eastern Europe and the Arab states and Africa, absolutely moving forward now. And I, I think there are a lot of lessons that uh, perhaps this region could learn from from their experiences. So. Hopefully we'll be able to share some of those over the next couple of days. But for this moment, uh, I think uh, time is getting upon us and I will move on to uh, the overview of uh, the, the features of DAB. And I'll just put that on, oops, we have done, done, it, done it backwards. <laughs> Try that, there we go. Okay, so I'll just, uh, Go full screen, turning my camera off. Thank you very much. And let's talk about DAB features. So we'll talk about broadcast features. I'll do a very, very quick receiver overview, although Joan's already touched on that, which is great, and talk a little bit about hybrid radio. So yes, we are moving from the analog world to the digital world. That's very evident in our everyday lives across every country in the world, I'm sure. 
and DAB is part of that future. So what are the basic features? Let's look at the overview of that. The first thing is the DAB is a digital data delivery system. It's a broadcast system and it provides multiple high quality audio and data services on a single transmission. Uh, we'll talk about the mechanics of that uh, tomorrow when we talk in particularly talk about uh, multiplexing and the uh, transmission part we'll talk about on Thursday. Now importantly we have multiple audio services. On one transmission typically we'll see between 18 and 24 audio services and each of those audio services can have its own individual bit rate. Um, typically we can go down as low as 32 kilobits per service but uh, the, the normal number is between 48 and 64 kilobits including program associated data. I'll talk a bit more about what that is in a minute. It's text and slideshow. And we have a number of advanced features including announcements and emergency warnings and we have data services as well. So first thing is audio. We have lots of room for services. This is what uh, Australia looked like in the commercial services AM and FM. In Sydney, we had about 20 AM and FM commercial and community broadcasters before DAB, and we now have over 60. So we can see here, there's a, a large range of new services, and, and that's what we need radio to have to compete in this modern world. It's extremely important to be able to do this. And we're seeing this as a real business case. And we're going to hear a bit more about this from Joan after this. I'm not going to dwell on it, but the uh, brand extension of, of existing simulcast services like Heart or NRK1 or the BBC services to new services has played a, a strategic and pivotal role in that business case. And we can see here uh, how the expansion in Australia has happened uh, over from example SCA with 2FM has now got 12 DAB. DAB offers a lot of flexibility. Each configure, each ensemble or multiplex can be dynamically configured and that allows us to do uh, pop-up stations which we can put on for a certain amount of time. We can have a station for Christmas for example. We can have stations which come up uh, just when there are touring artists, oh, wouldn't that be great again? Uh, we could have it for uh, sporting events or even situations of emergency. So a very flexible platform that can be shaped to what the broadcasters need. So let's look at some of these features. The first one is the way we choose our station. It's not listening to a particular frequency anymore although some services choose to retain their frequency, like in this example, you can see Nova 969. But what we also see are things like a strap line, plays new music first, uh, and a logo. So we can actually select services via their logos visually. And we can see that in an example in the bottom right corner here uh, in a car radio. So extremely important in cars because of drive distraction to be able to easily and quickly select the service you want. We have dynamic label or text and that can give us a whole range of information typically used to give uh, now playing, uh, next playing type of uh, music information but it can also be used for, for weather, for news uh, and a range of other things including advertising. The next program is going to be on the radio for example. And the same with our slideshow images. They can also be used for a wide range of, of, of purposes. Usually music programs will have uh, album art. Uh, sometimes you can even have lyrics. Uh, we can promote our, our presenters. We can give weather information and sports information and so on, all in parallel while we're actually listening to the radio. So two very valuable additions to what was traditionally just an audio service. We moved to data services <coughs> and a big one's traffic. 
uh, and this has been taken up quite quite strongly in Europe, the TPEG uh, traffic and information system, uh, where we can deliver uh, congestion information uh, th through broadcast only. Uh, it will also contain information such as uh, uh, fuel locations and prices. You know, I know in my city, in, in Sydney, that uh, just driving across the city, I can find petrol stations which have 20% uh, or more less than some of the more expensive ones. So important for the uh, funds. Uh, and of course, parking. If we're going to a shopping centre, we want to know what the parking is looking like. We also have data service like Journaline, which is essentially a hierarchical categorised data service. And that too can contain news and sports updates, uh, local weather information. And I emphasise local because DAB can come in two forms. Well, three really. It can go in national form, it can go in regional form, or it can go in local form. And certainly in Australia, we're uh, doing the local part first and rolling it out across our uh, local area licences. And if you really want, you can actually develop custom applications. This was done a while back uh, for financial services, actually, uh, as just one example. So the advanced features. Um, first of all, we have service and program information. And that's what's used to deliver those uh, station logos, those service links, those um, uh, strap lines, uh, and can also be used to deliver website links and program schedules. So it, those aspects are becoming increasingly important, particularly in the car. And we'll talk a bit more about that in hybrid radio. Uh, we also have announcements. We're all probably familiar with uh, traffic services and traffic information channels. Uh, I've certainly used them, particularly when I was in Europe, uh, and where you'll get a break in for a traffic service telling you what the status is on your motorway. And I found that to be very, very useful when traveling to London several times. Well, DAB does the same, except it does more. It can do the same, not only for traffic, but for news, weather, traveler information. And there's about 16 different categories of announcements which we can have, uh, including the emergency warning system or signal. Uh, and that's actually delivered in what's called the alarm. Uh, and in that case, the receiver will always switch to that alarm channel because that is for an emergency warning, whether it is a bushfire or it's a tsunami or it's a flood uh, or whatever. Whereas the other announcement services like traffic are completely under the control of the receiver operator, the, the listener. And another important service that's provided is called service following. And this is where links are distributed over the broadcast system to allow a receiver to switch between ensembles and services to try and maintain the existing service you're listening to. So you're listening in what area one uh, to your favorite service. And when you move out of the transmission range to another area which has the same service, you can automatically switch to that main, to maintain listening to your favourite service. Extensively used in Europe. Receivers, um, I think I'm out of date on the number. Was it up to 90 or 93 now? But certainly prices are $15 US. I'm even out of date on that from what uh, Joan said before. Uh, in Australia, we had prices as low as 15 Australian dollars, which is about uh, 12 US. Uh, and here's just some examples, actually, this is a year old as well. Digital radio is from $24 a uh, commonplace in Australia, $20 US. Whereas an AM FM is 19, so it's not really much difference in the price uh, and you get so much more with digital radio, so many more services. And of course in cars, so many cars, we've heard that there is a very big take up in Europe. Here's just an example of all of those logos from all of the brands, from the top end, the Aston Martins and the Bentleys right down to the bottom. So let's just briefly finish up on hybrid radio. Well, what is hybrid radio? 
Hybrid radio is really the next step in the evolution of radio. And what it does is it joins the broadcast world to the IP world. So it gives broadcasters the, the economy of scale to deliver mass audio content and some program associated data via broadcast, but also through the IP connection to deliver other information, which does include logos and program information, but also interactivity and increasingly metrics and analytics, alternative content and high quality uh, visuals, particularly for, for cars. So this has really been taken up uh, in, in the vehicle domain more than the home domain because of the high resolution screens that are available and the, the relatively large amount of listening that's also done in the car. Uh, so we can see it summarized quite well here. We get the best of both worlds from broadcast and that online connection. And there's new features being developed all the time in this space. And here are some of the brands that already naturally support this. The uh, Audi, VW, Porsche, BMW, most of their models now support hybrid radio. And there are a number of other brands uh, which are in development and will make uh, announcements, I think, um, if not late this year, certainly next year. And this runs not just uh, in Europe, this is now moving into uh, the US, it's uh, moving into Australia, and hopefully it will be moving into your country soon because it does just add that extra bit of value to what radio can deliver. So let's summarize now. I, I, I think the important points here, uh, DAB is a, a spectrally efficient but robust delivery system. We can get the audio quality tailored to the type of content that you want to deliver. So classical music might have a higher bit rate than pop, for example. We have our program associated data in, in text and images. We have those advanced features and data services and increasingly hybrid capabilities. And maybe most importantly of all, we have a wide range of low cost receivers available around the world. So I thank you for your, your attention today. Uh, and now I'm going to move straight back to Joan, who's going to talk about commercial business case. So thanks, Joan, uh, and uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Okay, I'll just get my screen up. Okay, well, I'm back again. Thank you very much for uh, once again having me here. In this session, I'm going to be focusing on just the Australian radio industry as a bit of a case study of commercial radio. Um, I'm going to have a look at DAB as a part of a multi-platform world because I think we have to be very realistic and understand that we're not just a single channel medium anymore. We're not just broadcast and in broadcast, in fact. We are not just one particular channel, AM or FM, with no other possibility of offering additional content. That's what DAB gives us. So how do we remain competitive in the current climate? And let's consider why incumbents benefit from digital radio and take a look at the vital role that radio and digital radio can play in times of emergency, which of course we have a lot of here in Australia and we know in our region there are uh, different times of the year that there are very uh, quite, a, quite a number of disasters that all our radio broadcasters are dealing with. Now in Australia, radio, including DAB and especially including DAB, continues to show enduring listening and engagement. Our listening has not gone down. In fact, radio listening in Australia has gone up every year for the past six years. And that's despite increased choice and competition, mainly from digital global, global digital platforms, including music streamers. 
Now, in the vibrant landscape of Australian commercial radio, there are 260 commercial radio stations and 12 major radio commercial radio networks, plus the ABC, which is the public service broadcaster, and of course, SBS, who you're going to hear from later, uh, and they are also a public service broadcaster. Almost 10.9 million people listened to commercial radio. So I'll, I'll be speaking in the main about commercial radio and uh, how we actually try to make money out of radio in this country. Um, and I know in many countries around APAC that the uh, public service broadcasters are allowed to take advertising. So perhaps some of what we say will be of interest. So we have about 10.9 million people listening to commercial radio in Australia each week across the five major cities, so Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane and Perth. The last Australian share of audio reports, so that's a report we do every year that has a look at how much time people spend with audio and then how much of that time they spend with different types of audio and different channels. Now, our last share of audio showed that live Australian radio, including DAB, still accounts for a large 62% of all audio listening in Australia, or all the time spent by Australians with audio, the majority is spent with live Australian radio. Here, radio is still the most preferred in-car audio for listeners, and smart speaker ownership, interestingly, another possible challenge for radio, has increased 340% in Australia in the last two years. Now, it's still very small, but the increase is uh, amazing in that it, these devices were not even on sale in Australia a couple of years ago. So over the past two years, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in interest in uh, artificial intelligence devices in the home. We formed partnerships with Google and Amazon to ensure that in those channels, the AI channels, that all Australian radio stations, including commercial, ABC and SBS, all our DAB stations could be found very easily and accessed very easily using voice technology. And that was a massive effort. We had some global first partnerships, but while the majority of listening is still via broadcast, these channels of listening also need to be considered. And we also need to take steps early to make sure we are where our listeners are. So all of the factors that are, that are happening around us mean that radio is, I think, in a good position to benefit from this economic recovery we're going to see um, after COVID-19. And we've all got our fingers crossed about that, but here in Australia, we're starting to feel a little optimistic We've also had a, a bushfire crisis in this country and uh, we had an already weakened economy. But the good news for uh, people who like to make money out of radio is that we've already seen an upwards trend in revenue from quarter four financial year 2020 to quarter one financial year 2021, with revenue up over 14% quarter to quarter and each metropolitan market has seen some gains in revenue after the drops uh, that we saw with COVID. Now, DAB is one of the most popular platforms for consuming radio in this country. It's, as you know, we have permanent services in nine markets and another permanent to roll out next year in the Gold Coast. But interestingly, Currently, more people listen to radio via DAB Plus than mobile, PC, tablets, and smart speakers combined. That must tell you something about the popularity of DAB once a consumer gets their hands on a DAB radio with all the additional channels that they can access. The results from our latest rating survey showed that 30.9 or nearly 31% of all people were listening to radio via DAB Plus. So that's, as I say, nearly three times as many as say they are listening via PCs, tablets and artificial intelligence devices. So this period of challenge and disruption has prompted a review of radio's position and a commitment to our future roadmap. So everybody had plenty of time during the lockdown here to actually take a step back and have a look at our industry and where we were going and whether we were going in the right direction. Now, we've already been evolving and investing in innovation for many years, so we're well placed to continue that. And radio around the world, of course, is doing the same thing. 
if we're to maintain competitive within the market and maintain our position as leaders within the audio space, because let's be clear, at the moment, radio is the leader in the audio space. Far and away, people spend more time with radio than they do with music streaming services. So let's not forget that. But we have to remain committed to embracing innovation and not only streaming our stations online. We have to have an innovative broadcast future so that we're, as we move forward and the older spectrum becomes less robust, we have a robust broadcast technology that can give us lots more opportunities to get new advertisers, to get new audiences. And that for us in Australia is DAB+. Of course, that's not to say we're ignoring streaming, we're not. We're also investing in streaming. We're investing in new ways of audience measurement. We're looking at, as I've said before, making sure that we are easily found first time every time on artificial intelligence devices and through the use of voice tech. Now, last year, we marked 10 years since the launch of DAB Plus Digital Radio in Australia. And I must say our commitment to making the technology available to as many Australians as possible has not wavered. We will continue to work on promoting and expanding DAB and we'll continue to advocate for federal government support to bring DAB to the smaller areas of Australia so that it's not just the big population centres or cities who have the benefits of many more channels being offered by incumbent broadcasters. Now, another area where radio, and I just mentioned it briefly, has always been an innovator is podcasting. And podcasting is a bit of a buzzword uh, around the world at the moment. Um, and it's something that radio, I think, has led the way in, with, certainly with podcasting. And there's been a lot of attention, probably more in the last couple of years than ever before, to podcasts. In order to have a look at the potential for podcasts to form a vital part of the radio audio ecosystem and create awareness for advertisers, the radio industry in Australia launched the Australian Podcast Ranker last year. And it is a monthly report, a common reporting framework of the top 100 most downloaded podcasts across Australia. It also has a top 10 publishers list. And this is not only to grow awareness of podcasts, it's to allow us to try and monetize the investment we've made in podcasts, but it also is a common framework for people who report on podcast consumption. And as I mentioned earlier, smart speaker ownership, of course, it's increasing. If we look at the US, it's double what Australia is and it seems to be doubling every couple of years. It will be interesting to see if that trend continues. But as I say, in order to make sure that you're there, you need to form some strategic partnerships to make sure your content is available. And when someone gets their Google speaker out of the box, they ask for their favorite radio station that they can find that station very easily. We've also, just in terms of the general industry, we've been working very hard on a product called Radio Matrix, and it's our advanced industry-wide ad buying platform. It, its aim is to simplify and revolutionise how media agencies and direct advertisers plan and buy radio advertising through one platform that connects them to 360 radio stations. That's just completing testing and will go live early next month. Now, through that platform, advertisers and direct advertisers and agencies will be able to purchase DAB, uh, advertising on DAB stations. They'll also be able to purchase podcasts and, of course, advertising on AM and FM radio, which, of course, still are the main ways in which people listen to radio in this country. Now, as I said before, radio is a multi-platform content provider with a broad reach and the ability to engage millions of people across a range of platforms. What we need to do is make sure all of our platforms work together, that we can uh, come up with smart ways and cost-effective ways to integrate the activations that we can have across all of our platforms to enhance the experience for not only the advertiser, but for the listener. Each platform in the radio ecosystem has benefits for different sections of the community at different times of the day and depending on what they're doing. So as I've often said at conferences, we would never say that radio listeners do not use music streaming services. I'm sure they do for, part of, for a small part of the day as we now know from our research. We would never say that radio listeners do not use podcasts. Some of them do. 
Not a lot of them yet, but that percentage is also growing. Whereas we have heard tales where music streaming services have said that people that use music streaming services do not listen to radio. We do not believe the audiences are mutually exclusive. And that's why DAB gives incumbent radio broadcasters the opportunity to compete, not only via broadcast and having multi-channels, but also to stream those channels as well. So you compete, can compete with some of the uh, music streaming services that are trying to eat away at radio revenue. Now, the previously mentioned innovative projects that I've talked about and strategies, along with DAB Plus Digital Radio, are important parts of a multi-platform offering by radio. So radio's future is evolving and audiences demand flexibility in how they enjoy and access radio and all of our other audio products. We've got to keep innovating, we've got to keep developing. Back to DAB, DAB is improving the broadcast radio experience for listeners in Australia. The benefits of DAB for established radio listeners are clear. It gives listeners a better, richer radio experience that can include images and integration with the internet and voice tech. It gives listeners more choice of stations, including music, educational programs, foreign language programs, and stations serving niche audiences, such as children's programming. There's also pop-up short-term stations that can celebrate festivals and events. Better sound quality, certainly than AM, and DAB station selection and tuning is easy and intuitive. Also, on most screens, they're alphabetically listed, so it's, uh, it's easy to find your favourite station on DAB. For broadcasters, DAB Plus is cheaper and greener to operate. Now, that is becoming, as we know, more and more important in uh, the current world and concerns about climate change. DAB Plus is estimated to be one-tenth the cost of FM, with 18 to 20 stations sharing the costs of a single transmission. That means less power used, less infrastructure needed, and less space taken up. That is more spectrum efficient than AM or FM. So broadcasters can launch more stations, therefore attracting more listeners, offering more opportunities to advertisers and increasing their ability to meet the needs of governments when it comes to sharing messages and reaching people in emergencies. It allows opportunities for shared infrastructure and is a way for broadcasters to unite to control and protect how they distribute their most vital asset, that is their radio content to audiences. That gives audiences, gives networks the freedom to experiment with fresh new channels. It allows innovation and strengthens product offerings with content tailored to new audiences, while also increasing audiences for existing shows. DAB can provide, and I think you might hear a little bit about this from some of the other speakers in this webinar, incremental increase in listener numbers and reach. As listeners, if they move from the main station, may go on to one of the additional DAV Plus stations and listen to your network for longer. Australian networks are seeing commercial benefits of promoting DAB alongside their other audio channels. And again, you'll hear more about this later. It creates chances for new partnerships. It creates chances to attract new advertisers who may never have thought they could advertise on radio because the main FM or AM channels were too expensive and too cluttered. It allows some advertisers to try radio as a branding mechanism or to improve their brand position by monetizing their digital brand extensions. Stations are here in Australia, networks in Australia have tried all different approaches to uh, coming up with the business proposition for DAB Plus. And you are going to hear from one of the most successful of them a little bit later through Adam Lewiskopf. There are so many possibilities that DAB brings to broadcasters, opening the doors to innovation. And I keep saying cost effective because costs are, uh, with power in, power increases in power costs, of course, sometimes spiralling out of control with our traditional AM and FM. So we're looking for sustainability for the industry as a broadcast medium, as well as a digital medium. DAB stations provide, as I said, new advertising opportunities by building on analogue radio's mass audience 
and giving advertisers a more comprehensive, nuanced and targeted audio solution. And it gives you the opportunity to access niche and special interest audience. Advertisers can take advantage of integrated stacked buying opportunities, getting more value for their money and increasing the reach of their messaging. It's an affordable and simple solution for advertisers navigating these days restricted advertising budgets. Okay, so we know radio is a powerful medium with the ability to keep communities connected and informed during emergencies, especially in regional and rural areas. While there's been a global crisis to navigate in 2020, in Australia, we also faced difficult times at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, with many Australians impacted by the devastating national bushfires. Both of these, along with countless other crises over the past years, reinforced radio's vital role in emergencies and how essential it is and will remain. Our recent research shows that 74% of listeners look to radio to provide information during an emergency situation. At the height of COVID lockdown in Australia, audiences turned to radio for information, news, entertainment and companionship, with a GFK study showing radio listening increased during lockdown by an average of one hour and 46 minutes per day. 72% of Australians said they were listening to as much or more radio during COVID restrictions. So as we know, radio is a vital part of communications in the height of emergencies, as many commercial radio stations and public service radio stations in regional and rural locations deliver 24-7 updates to people in those areas that are listening and provide a platform, a reliable, robust, deliverable platform for authorities and emergency services to use to give pub the public the information that it needs. DAB allows for a more mature, cost-effective and efficient use of spectrum. And this can flow through to a dynamic use of spectrum during emergencies. Broadcasters can launch special emergency pop-up stations to distribute information or to provide targeted entertainment and information during an emergency or, or a health crisis like COVID. This was the case when the HIP network launched a pop-up DAB station, Little Fox, designed to keep children under 10 entertained, connected and educated while lockdown was on in Victoria. DAB can also provide rich multimedia to support information delivery. For example, taking emergency feeds and broadcasting them over DAB station displays as scrolling text and slideshows, using DAB to show the current fire rating alongside station logos, album art and the weather and allowing embedded links to provide additional information if the radio receiver has a connection to the internet. So, we can't underestimate the importance of live and local radio. Often broadcast radio is the only place people can turn to in times of emergency, with mobile phone towers damaged or overloaded, and access to television and other broadcast channels made difficult by the situation and conditions. Radio shines in a crisis, and this has never been more evident than during the COVID pandemic. And I think it has been an eye opener for many officials and uh, public servants when they see just how local people have relied on their local radio station, particularly as an important channel for the federal government during the COVID-19 crisis here, with a large number of information campaigns being run on radio knowing that these messages will get direct to the listening audience. So radio plays a role in building community resilience following emergencies and disasters. And again, DAB allows short-term pop-up services for as long as is needed. If there needs to be a relief station, where can I go and get food? Where can I go and get some uh, petrol for my generator? We can have a short-term DAB plus station which pops up for a few weeks after the emergency so that people can find their information easily. Radio continues to provide this assistance in recovery efforts after emergencies, not only in providing information, but as you would all know, if you're a radio broadcaster or work with radio broadcasters, radio also undertakes a lot of charity work after 
emergencies and often raises enormous amounts of money or donations of goods to help local communities. Again, DAB allows for a flexible pop-up approach to that so that their information is on 24 seven. So there's just, you'll see on screen now, just a few initiatives that people undertook after the bushfires, the drought and, co and during COVID to see if we could make our communities happier, feel better and feel more comfortable by having their familiar local radio station helping them out. And there are only a few of a multitude of initiatives. Now I'm nearly finished and I just have to say, as you probably guessed, I believe broadcast is a business of change and we've experienced change like no other in the last 12 months. Now, while we've been impacted by tough times, I think we can be confident that the strengths of radio, as well as our strategies to evolve, innovate, implement, educate, promote, and celebrate radio, will see us well placed to thrive once the recovery process begins. We need to be everywhere, broadcast efficiently through DAB+, as well as online. Don't forget we can't afford to stay forever in the single stream analog space dab sets radio broadcasters free in the broadcast space to innovate grow flourish and have the opportunity to grow the business we need to look to the future to retain our central role in the community and to continue to grow our industry thank you very much thank you joe that was uh quite inspiring you know, there's so many ways that the broadcast industry is innovative and just keeps building and we see that uh, it goes around and round and it always comes back to broadcast first now, there's no reason why there's all those other services you mentioned the streaming the podcast so so forth they're all support they all provide provide for support for broadcasters and help keep that ecosystem healthy so we are now going to hear from from adam williscroft who's the content director at hit and triple m digital radio at southern cross stereo and adam is going to tell us about the strategy that's made their dab uh, innovations so successful so over to you adam thank you very much thank you um well uh, let's make sure you can see my screen. Uh, well, look, since the launch of DAB Plus in Australia in 2009, as Joan mentioned, there's been a lot of trial, I guess, by commercial uh, broadcasters, how to best use, uh, utilise, ultimately monetise the allocation of uh, spectrum. So there are different strategies within the different networks. Uh, however, Southern Cross Stereo is Australia's largest commercial radio broadcaster and largest holder of commercial DAB spectrum in Australia, uh, we've ultimately embraced a strategy that maximises uh, our investment in, in this medium uh, simply by adding scale. But I guess the key word is, is trying to do that with relative uh, simplicity. Um, look, initially we have experimented with several standalone brands. Uh, not only do you have the challenge, the same challenge of ratings with smaller, more unfamiliar brands but there is the uh, overall challenge of monetizing smaller brands as well implementing a successful sales strategy for example or you know, resourcing that sales team as well it's very challenging to sell a one-off DAB station with the same sales team that perhaps is used to selling a high rating FM station for example without totally changing the way that you do business to ensure that that can happen I mean, it's hard work it's not it's not necessarily uh, cost-effective to, to do that either um, so three years ago, uh, around November 2017, we, we did totally change the way we did business with DAB for SCA. It was a brand extension strategy. It ultimately changed the entire radio operation for our, for our business, to be honest, using the reputation of, I guess, our established FM brands. We created spin-off products, if you like, as line extension stations. Um, you know, two FM stations in HIT and Triple M in each city became 12 brands under that umbrella. And in doing that, you know, the business suddenly uh, was able to operate on a much bigger scale. While, you know, I guess our footprint and the size of the stations grew, we wanted to try and keep the sales process and, and, and ultimately the, the subsequent offering to the market as simple as possible. Um, 
you know, now that we could, I guess, aggregate our audiences on FM and DAB to help tackle things like market share, th this new brand family tree provided the opportunity for uh, a commercial advantage in that respect by combining the unduplicated listeners to both our FM and our brand extended um, uh, DAB stations, we can suddenly offer more of a scale of audience reach, which you know, Joan touched on earlier. So, um, you know, these um, sub brands, if you like, were designed to be brand safe options, but to also complement the, the parent FM brand, if you like. So our um, male skewed uh, Triple M brands, for example, grew from five Metro FM stations to 23 odd, I think, Triple M branded stations at the moment. And similarly, our female skewed uh, hit network went from five FM stations to uh, you know, around the same number of hit branded network stations in these same Metro capital cities. So we suddenly created scale, scale in stations, but also scale in, in reach by launching local versions of each of these DA brands uh, DAB brands in, in each city. It allowed us to bundle that unduplicated audiences, if you like, across all of our broadcast assets on both FM networks and these suite of DAB stations. And at the same time, trying to offer, I guess, that scale to clients by duplicating all of the local inventory that was carried on our uh, FM station. So in every city, if you like, every station within the brand suite carries the same commercial inventory as their local market FM station, their parents. So uh, when a commercial is bought, booked and run on say uh, in Sydney on Triple M FM, for example, that same commercial runs across the Triple M line extended stations on DAB in Sydney. So Triple M Classic Rock, Soft Rock, Hard and Heavy, uh, Country, Triple M 90s, all on DAB. So as a client, your commercial plays across the entire Triple M brand suite of stations in that, um, in that specific market, if you will. So this gave sales and agencies a larger scale of audience, but still with the simplicity of one commercial now airing across uh, multiple stations. The, there's one commercial spot still, it's one booking process, it's the same post analysis, if you like, that same one invoice to the client. Um, I guess simultaneous commercial placement across the digital stations and the FM station in that market, market when a booking is made is the um, best way to, uh, to think about that. Um, in launching this strategy, I guess we were able to raise the cost of our commercials. Um, at launch, the commercial rate increase was around 5%. It did take you know six months or so for the company to educate key clients, to educate agencies. As with anything, when you're asking for a price increase, there's you know going to be reluctance. What's in it for me? Um, going through, making sure that benefit is understood. Um, I guess nobody's kind of done anything like this in, in this territory. So the education around that commercial spot essentially being like a, a single indicated spot, if you will, um, that your commercial plays simultaneously across the brands to you know, focus from the team within the business, but also uh, outside. Uh, and I've got to say overall agencies, clients, very accepting of the strategy when you see what's what's in it, the audience, the benefits, the reach. Uh, the most recent survey for our DAV brands saw uh, an increase of our QM audience of around 8.3%. Um, so um, you can see that there's you know growth in this listing. Um, I think for me personally, another benefit is in uh, DAB internally being raised in value. So for the business, you know, uh, the value of one listener on DAB Plus is essentially the same as one listener on FM. So the beauty of, I guess, an audience strategy means that, you know, the, a listener is a listener and a listener is equal. So bundling together the, the incremental aligned station reach, um, you know, gives us nearly 5 million people as of the last survey, which, you know, is a, is a great number. Um, I think another benefit of the brand extension strategy here is the brand retention. Um, again, it's been touched on earlier, but by, by line extending our FM stations to be more niche sub brands, we've been able to capture more listeners in a broader brand suite rather than necessarily lose them to a competitor if they're going to change stations, whether that be a you know, radio station or a streaming platform, uh, you know, competing for time, it doesn't matter if they're leaving, they're leaving. So um, I, I feel that retention of the um, floating Hume within the stack of our complementing stations, if you will, has really helped us with that scale. And the listeners are consuming them together within the same parent brands. So this brand extension, if you like, has created an opportunity to, to you know, aggregate our audiences together, um, capture this incremental reach within our brands, but keep them within this, uh, you know, this um, ecosystem. So 
brand extension certainly helped SCA to remain competitive when it comes to audience reach throughout the survey year. Um, sales have been either, you know, uh, I guess, either able to charge a premium rate or in periods where there's some ratings turbulence across uh, the FM stations within the business, for example, the aggregated audience has allowed us to, to potentially, in some instances, maintain a certain rate. Other radio networks may have had to reduce their rates in a similar situation where, um, you know, been given a bit of a, uh, a chance to hold that buffer has given us a chance to hold that uh, that rate at times. Um, I guess since the launch of this strategy, uh, late 2017, um, the audience growth of all of the bundled assets has you know, hit, hit up around 12%, which, which is great. The QM share has been lifted by an average of about 7.5 each um, survey since we started the aggregation of both FM and, and DAV audiences. Um, when you think of an initial rate rise around 5%, that, that kind of return is what you would want to at least expect. I guess the um, return on investment means that we've been able to increase our metropolitan um, commercial audience share with this uh, brand extension um, strategy. So the unduplicated audience has lifted commercial share annually around an average of two share points. Now that, that's two share points higher than you'd be able to do if you're just using your FM audience uh, figures uh, potentially. So even looking at an add-on bonus um, through a brand extension strategy at worst, this kind of buoyancy that can help take some pressure off the FM part of the business, not make it a standalone dependency as uh, as it has and, and is in some cases, um, adds a bit of a buffer if you like, help weather some of those bounces, market nuances across um, you know some of the FM markets or stations when there might be some audience loss, uh, particularly when you're talking about a national footprint on on the scale that uh, that Southern Cross Stereo operates on in, in so many different markets. So so look, the bottom line, I guess, is commercial radio is a, is a you know, the, the, the win here is a higher commercial audience share allows you to leverage a higher revenue share um, with this strategy, uh, with the DAB brand extension, you know, we've been able to leverage leverage that. Uh, you look at the Australian metropolitan radio market um, worth around $785 million or thereabouts at different times, one share point, you know, suddenly worth um, a fair bit of money. I mean really brand extension and the unduplicated audience strategy across the last two years could almost be seen if you if you want to view it that way as adding a new revenue stream if you didn't want to look at the you know the other aspects of buoyancy or uh, or whatever so you know, fragmented media markets, potentially diminishing returns, an ability to reach mass audience by aggregation has certainly helped. I, I think our business will give us a, a positive um, in this specific case. I mean, clearly you need to have the available spectrum. You, you need a capital investment with the infrastructure or uh, elements of technology if you don't. Um, obviously a few heads for, uh, for, for resource, but overall, I mean, a pretty small percentage of what the overall revenue opportunities with, with brand extension on this scale. Bearing in mind, you know, um, a, a revenue pool can be um, uh, influenced by a bunch of moving parts, certain market pressures, um, movements in local FM audiences, the global economy, the the ability to convert an opportunity by sales teams. But you know, a, an opportunity of around 10 to 15 million dollars when the stars align. So you can certainly see that there's there's value to add. Um, so brand extension. Ultimately, uh, to, you know, for me, it, it does add value. It, it adds audience. You can strengthen a value for advertisers by by adding that reach. And as I said, ultimately, I guess if it allows you to achieve a higher commercial share, it, it has the ability uh, for you to increase your revenues. Uh, as Joan touched on earlier, the you know COVID nineteen disruption to everywhere in the world um, has meant that the audience surveys in Australia, uh, you know, were, were held. Um, last month, September saw the first results since March, and there was um, an audience increase in our DAB brand extension stations of around 8.3%, uh, which is uh, which is great. So look, that gap in data has potentially made it harder to trend through COVID, but um, you know, it's been reported around the world, I guess, that the audio consumption increases have happened with more people spending time and sampling audio. Um, you know, in the last quarter alone, uh, the brand retention has shown up to nearly 7 million streams on some of the, on just the DAV assets. So having our stations on all devices, being able to capture the audience where they are is, is um, you know, critically important. 
So again, you can see, I guess, with this um, value, the, the, the real value is in the new audience that you can add on to a parent brand through brand extension. And I guess to wrap up, um, this is a very specific example of Australian radio. Obviously, it does show there's an opportunity for scale. There's an opportunity for reach. You can grow an audience, but just uh, as importantly, um, in this day and age, you can retain an audience with an overall brand with brand extension. Uh, and, and I guess a final thought in, in these, you know, turbulent times we talk of uh, that, that added buffer of stability that line extension can potentially add to a network in combating any other you know ratings uh, or revenue pressures is a, is a hidden bonus value if you like um, and ultimately increasing the audience um, you know means that you can achieve a higher commercial market share which brings in the opportunity as a business to increase your revenue and that's ultimately the uh, the end game so thank you thanks for your time Thank you, Adam. That was really revealing. Uh, I think that really goes to show just what value DAB can have over the top of what you already got in, in an analog space. Uh, additional stations uh, can be broadcast, but remember they can also be streamed. And I think it's uh, important to remember that that uh, broadcasters are content producers, uh, and that's the primary business. So um, I, th I think very insightful uh, presentation and, and thank you very much for that, Adam. Thank you. Okay, so that's great. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we're actually quite a bit over time here. So, um, but do please keep your questions coming. Uh, even if we have to answer them tomorrow or uh, uh, later by uh, uh, text. So um, the next presenter is Andrew Bolton. He's the head of the Arabic 24 DAB plus channels at the special broadcasting service here in Australia. Uh, a, a great case study, uh, and I'd like now to uh, hand over to, to Andrew uh, to hear his story. Thank you. Thank you, Les. G'day, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, as Les said, I'm the program manager uh, from um, Multicultural Public Broadcaster, SBS, uh, in Australia. I'm responsible for SBS Arabic 24, which was uh, launched as a DAB plus 24-7 radio channel back in uh, 2016. Before we get to uh, SBS Arabic 24 today, as the uh, number one most listened to Arabic radio station in Australia, let me give you a little bit of history uh, and, and I guess some, uh, some valuable context. Starting in 1975, SBS Radio has grown up with multicultural Australia um, uh, and is now the world's most linguistically diverse broadcaster. Uh, it's a bridge linking to the 21% of Australians who speak another language. Um, more languages broadcast on SBS than uh, Vatican Radio, uh, BBC World Service, etc. So, yep, m world's most linguistically diverse broadcaster. And uh, we broadcast in um, 68 languages uh, that are spread across multiple channels. Um, and services for those 63 languages are currently active, um, going all the way from Amharic uh, to Vietnamese. And five of those languages um, are currently uh, in recess. So what's our current offering? Well, SBS Radio's um, seven DAB plus channels include SBS Radio 1 and 2, which is what SBS Radio started off with 45 years ago, uh, FM and AM radio stations in all the capital cities across Australia, uh, and then expanded through to the regional network. Um, but those two channels, Radio 1 and 2, host our 63 active language services in our information uh, format network. Each language gets between one hour and 14 hours a week uh, on the schedule, depending on the size of the audience. And we determine um, the amount of hours on the schedule uh, every five years through the census that's done in Australia. So on Radio 1 and Radio 2, it's really uh, a niche a niche cast, a narrow cast uh, by invitation, because almost every hour you have a different language um, that's uh, broadcasting uh, on SBS. SBS Radio 3 hosts the uh, BBC World Service, while SBS Chill, Pop Asia and Pop Desi are our automated uh, music channels. 
They were um, launched in 2010 and then in uh, 2016 we converted what was POP Araby into SBS Arabic 24. And according to independent research conducted in July this year by McNair, SBS now reaches 55% of all Arabic speaking Australians each week. And that's across all of our platforms. But we grew from a, a pretty small base, a two hour a day Arabic program on FM. Uh, the expansion happened on the back of DAB Plus, uh, absolutely instrumental in our extending our reach and growing our audience. I'll return to that in a little bit, uh, in a little bit, uh, in a few minutes. Um, but first, let's dig into exactly what SBS Arabic 24 is. It's SBS Radio's first 24-hour in-language channel, um, and it's the first 24-hour news and current affairs radio station. Also, an online hub delivering the latest Australian and international news information and entertainment to Arabic-speaking Australians. Um, Arabic 24 comprises Australian-based radio programs, nine hours per weekday. So we have a breakfast program, six to nine, um, a, a morning program, nine to midday. We go to the BBC for midday to three, and then we bring back an afternoon drive program from three to six. Uh, and then we um, partner with BBC Arabic and Monte Carlo uh, Dualia for, for some of our content. Uh, we also produce hourly news in Arabic with an Australian focus. So it's 70% uh, Australian news, 30% uh, homeland and overseas. Uh, and that's an hourly news bulletin in Arabic from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every weekday. The channel was launched in March 2016 and it's grown to a team of 18 um, very talented and very committed people. Um, in essence, uh, we are a digital channel that just happens to simulcast on FM two hours a day. So 24 hours DAB plus and two of those hours also go out on FM uh, between 6 and 8 a.m. That is our uh, breakfast program. So our audience is uh, Arabic speakers in Australia. Simple as that. Um, and you probably didn't know this, but Arabic is actually the third most spoken language in Australia. That surprises many people. But uh, according to the census, that's true as of 2016. And uh, it comes directly after English and Mandarin. So. Most Arabic speakers in Australia come from either Iraq, Egypt, Syria, Sudan, uh, or Lebanon. And then there's a, a long tail of much smaller countries contributing people uh, as migrants to Australia. There are eight other Arabic radio stations, and we're number one um, with a healthy 28% weekly market share. And online, we have uh, a web page that's quadrupled the number of hits since launch. Our Facebook page has 205,000 uh, highly engaged followers. And our podcast audience is also growing enormously. So audio is still very much um, the main game here um, and growing with an average of 200,000 downloads per month. And that average was achieved between uh, January um, and July this year. So um, Arabic is the only language on SBS radio that has its um, own dedicated channel. And uh, why is that, you may ask? Well, um, back in 2016, the conflict in the Middle East was heating up especially in Syria and the Abbott government, the then Abbott government created a special humanitarian intake for 12,000 persecuted Syrians and Iraqis. Uh, these people would be coming to Australia as refugees with likely little knowledge of Australia and quite possibly low English skills. So we needed a service that could help them settle well into Australia uh, that provided information um, in their own language. The challenge was how to bring audiences across from our existing two hour FM radio program on SBS Radio 1 to the new exclusive full time Arabic channel uh, in partnership with BBC Arabic on DAB Plus. We had to create a bridge uh, and a programming strategy to incentivize our FM listeners to keep listening through the day on DAB Plus. The FM window uh, closed at 8 a.m. and that frequency at that time then picked up another language. Um, as there's a bit of a peculiarity of SBS Radio 1 and 2, but the Arabic channel now kept broadcasting on DAB Plus for the rest of the day. So what did we do to try and get people from FM to where obviously the majority of our audience was at the time uh, onto DAB Plus? Between 7.30 and 8 o'clock on the FM Breakfast Show, we alerted our listeners to the daily quiz and gave them questions to answer uh, after 8 a.m. They could only answer those questions after 8 a.m., which means they would have to switch over to the DAB Plus um, broadcast. 
Um, and the winner of the daily quiz, which was really just a simple current affairs question based on the news of the day, um, would win a digital radio. And we did this every day, five days a week for five months, giving away around 100 digital radios, uh, which were branded SBS Arabic 24 with instructions on how to tune in. So that was getting our audience from FM to DAB+. We also had to alert new potential audience members, Arabic speakers, to our existence. So we got our marketing team involved to boost our paid, earned and owned advertising. Uh, paid advertising mostly went on search engine marketing. Uh, keywords uh, were submitted to Google, uh, such as Arabic news in Australia, Arabic radio, Arabic immigration, Arabic information in Australia and so on. Um, and we also boosted Arabic content on Facebook, which of course uh, is one of our biggest referrers for content. And owned advertising was conducted on SBS platforms while earned media came from media releases to ethnic and mainstream press in Australia. We also engaged home affairs and border force so that uh, postcards, physical old fashioned postcards on how to tune in and get online with SBS Arabic 24 were in the welcome packs that were given to Arabic speaking refugees arriving in Australia. This meant they immediately had a connection in Arabic to everything they needed to know about Australia. So, the strategy was successful and the need was there. It was clearly uh, demonstrated and we've now nearly doubled the audience compared to our nearest competitor. Uh, we have around 80,000 listeners per week and about 160,000 regularly engaging online via our webpage, uh, radio app, social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And not to mention all of our third party podcast providers like Google, Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts. And almost a fifth of our audience listens to us on digital television, where we have an audio output uh, on channel 36 on all smart TVs in Australia. And I believe that reaches about 90% of the uh, total population. So in reality, um, we grew our audience off the back of the DAB plus channel expansion, which would not have been possible as a two hour program on an FM frequency that was hosting multiple languages per day. So SBS Arabic 24 was the first big 24 seven audio current affairs brand under the SBS radio umbrella to be freed from the tyranny of the uh, FM radio sh schedule. Thanks to DAB plus this allowed us to offer more and more diverse programming for our target audience. It grew the audience, more people began listening and it also uh, very importantly underpinned SBS's purpose of promoting social cohesion by uh, making non English speaking arrivals feel at home in Australia. Thanks very much for the um, for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I look forward to any non-technical questions uh, if you have them at the end. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, that's a, a great little presentation there, and I, I think uh, you'd be a, the the envy of many commercial operators the way you've actually grown your audience. Uh, I heard many. You know, innovative approaches and I think uh, the quiz one was just a classic for me so uh, uh, thank you for sharing that that's that's fantastic thank you okay yeah, no problem no problem good stuff okay so we're at the end now uh, I've still got my presentation to go so uh, we are going to be a bit over time hopefully you'll still be able to stay with us for the time being okay I'm going to talk about technical business case uh, and that has two main parts, uh, radio distribution costs and the use of 5G uh, technologies for the future. It's something which a lot of people uh, discuss and not many understand. So hopefully I'll be able to shed some light on uh, the good bits and the misconceptions. So um, let's start looking at the distribution costs themselves. There's several technologies available for delivery of audio content or radio content, because remember radio today is very much a multimedia uh, content delivery. There's been lots of studies <coughs> pardon me, on the cost efficiency of broadcast versus other technologies. But I think we have to take in mind what Joan was talking about, that it's a multi-distribution world. Radio broadcasters, of old are now becoming content producers and they want to get their content and the best form of that content to listeners uh, everywhere. So um, most focus on the technical cost of operating distribution systems, but we must also remember that it is a duty 
of broadcasters to provide content and coverage to all listeners in their prescribed coverage area. And that's whether you're commercial, a community, or a public service broadcaster. So let's have a look at a bit of the distribution analysis that's been done. And I'll draw on one in particular here. It's the EBU analysis that was done a few years ago now, about three years ago. And it clearly showed for a hypothetical group of countries uh, that the DAB operational expenses is far less than FM, but it's also far less than uh, just using streaming as well. Um, I think the other thing that we found, or that, that particular uh, study found, is that uh, uh, even 10% of listening, which is a, a, class, a standard number in many countries of streaming, costs roughly the same as the 90% for, for, um, for DAB. So uh, that's a very big difference. You know, that's almost 10 times the cost to actually stream. Now, sure, those costs have probably changed, I know DAB costs of delivery have come down, and I also know that uh, data centers and streaming costs have come down too. So just what the balance is today, it's another study to be done. But what we do know is uh, yeah, that broadcasters generally, on, on actual cost information that we've, we've received from different broadcasters, it's actually about one-fifth. So you get five times as many services for the same transmission cost. And, th and that's reflected in both metro sites and what I'd call regional or you know, country sites, with country sites being much cheaper to operate the cost of the, the land and the, the sites is often the highest of your OPEX costs, and that is always cheaper in the country than it is in the city. Uh, and I talked to people in Norway, for example, and what they told me is that the cost of operating their DAB network for 10 years uh, is about the same as their FM. The difference is, though, that the cost for DAB included all new transmitters, so all of their transmission system costs are amortised into their operating cost, and that's quite significant when you're establishing a national network in a short amount of time. And the other thing is that on average, there are at least five times more services available to Norwegians than they were for their FM and AM services, mainly FM, they didn't have much AM. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm going to move on to the, uh, the 5G topic. Um, because I think that's actually you know, quite a relevant and topic for future decision making. And I'm, I'm going to take it my examples from, from the Australian landscape. Uh, and this is an example here of the latest national broadband network rollout. Uh, and this is using wired IP. So while that will give uh, good IP delivery to towns uh, around the country, there are large spaces which aren't covered by the NBN. The mobile network in Australia, this is the Telstra network, which is the, the best network we have, again, also has large Penetration. And Australia's got relatively high penetration, uh, certainly on a population basis. And we can also see the rollout of 5G here. This was the, the stat about a month ago, and we can see that there are so called 5G uh, equipments uh, in the capital cities there Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Adelaide, with a, a smattering to the, some of the larger, larger regional centres. So where does 5G come into play with, uh, with radio? Well, um, there's a couple of places where we use it, and it's all about you know, streaming audio content. And, and the first one is um, 
the individual streaming radio. And that's right down in that bottom left corner there. You know, typically we'd see speeds of 64 to 128 kilobits per service. Uh, we don't really care about delay too much. And in fact, many uh, streaming services have significant delays to overcome breaks in uh, delivery, particularly when it's going over mobile networks. So mobile dropouts are often compensated by delays in delivery of 30 seconds to 60 seconds. So it's not a real time. It's close to real time, obviously, but it's not real time. Uh, and when you want to deliver to a large number of people via streaming, uh, you get this, this ellipse here on the bottom. Uh, and it still has the delay, but now you're ki kicking up to hundreds of megabits per second, depending on what your uh, listening base is. If it's hundreds of thousands, it's certainly going to be in the hundreds or even gigabits per second. Because remember, every streaming connection is a one-to-one -one connection. And the other area that it can come into quite a valuable territory is studio links whether that's from outside broadcasts or whether to transmission sites uh, or between studios, that is a low delay requirement. It needs to be very short delay, but it is also high bit rate or high capacity requirements in the hundreds of megabits quite often. And that will be increasingly so as increased multimedia content is delivered as well. Uh, and that sort of sits in the next slide where uh, we see where's, where does it fit in the various categories of 5G. And radio streaming really sits in the LTE into the enhanced mobile broadband space. So it's more about bit rate than the other uh, facets of 5G like you know, massive machines and ultra reliability. Not to say reliability isn't important in radio, it certainly is. And we heard a fair bit about that from Joan about uh, emergency situations and our bushfires last year was a good example of that. <coughs> so let's talk about contribution. One of the really good things that 5G is, is bringing to mobile networks is uh, the ability to slice the network, the so-called network slicing. And that gives the ability to provide a specific quality of service to a specific link. So you can immediately imagine this is very important for studio to, to transmit links uh, and also to outside broadcast links. Now, the thing we have to remember here, there's a few caveats on this. The first one is that network slicing is really currently only defined in the core network. It's not defined in the radio access network. So there's work being done on that now and hopefully we'll see some output from that uh, probably around 2022 timeframe. The next thing is the high capacity. The very high capacity links are reliant on using higher frequency spectrum, particularly 3.6 and the uh, 26 slash 39 gigahertz bands. They have their own issues, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And the final thing is we're still trying to get a business model for this. Uh, we've got other troubles with business models as well in this space, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So for distribution, um, well, I think um, in terms of streaming over mobile, uh, EMBB in the towns and cities will certainly uh, reduce the overall you know, percent load. Uh, uh, and that's gonna be mainly in the bigger, bigger towns. Um, but remember, when we get this bigger spectrum, it is reliant on these higher frequency bands. It's also reliant on higher order modulation, such as 56 quam, and that's not particularly robust in a mobile environment. A lot of effort's gone into creating the appropriate coding schemes to support higher order modulation to help increase that robustness, but it's still subject to, to fading and issues uh, so we come back to the delivery, really, especially in wider areas being uh, confined almost to the sub gigahertz bands, the 700 to 900, uh, and that's likely to go lower in the next uh, World Radio Conference. It might get down to 600 or even 450 
megahertz because telcos are looking at UA, UHF um, to actually bolster their ability to provide wider services at longer distances. And even in the current 5G, the, the um, NBIOT, which is specialized for long distances, only has a range of about 10 kilometers. We need ranges of 20, 30, 40, 50 plus kilometers. And we can achieve that. We achieve that in DAB now. Uh, and probably very critically, there are very few receivers at this point, but that's increasing, of course. Okay. So let's look at the spectrum implications. Um, so here's a graph of path loss versus frequency. Uh, and you can see there's pretty big numbers here. Uh, and we're using some pretty straightforward models uh, which show the path loss in a line of sight situation uh, over a range of frequencies. So we start down at DAB plus at 200 megahertz and a 10 kilometer path is a loss of about 97 dB. Okay, if we move that up to 900 megahertz in the lower end of the mobile band, a 10 kilometer path loss increases to 111 dB. That's 14 dB more. So you get less than 1 20th of the signal power uh, when you go at 900, then you do at 200. And that has a significant impact on how far your signal will travel. Because the receiver, of course, as a fixed uh, receiver operating point, it has a, a fixed noise figure, uh, and, a, a, and that will determine whether it will be able to dig the signal out of the noise floor. If we start moving up, though, we get to 3.6 gigs, which is you know, seen as the, the balance between capacity and, and speed and coverage. We see that the path loss has gone up to 124 dB. So that's now 27 dB, almost a thousandth of the power received. So you can tell that the range of a 3.6 gigahertz mobile service is not going to be that far. It's going to be a few kilometers maybe five at the best. And when we get to the 39 gigahertz band, we're now at 150 dB loss. That's over 50, 53 dB. So that's 200 thousandths of the power. And that is why when we're operating at these high frequencies, particularly the gigahertz, high gigahertz bands, the cell sizes are very, very small, half a kilometer maybe, at 26, 39 gigahertz. So that has a real impact on how 5G can be used for distribution. The more bandwidth you need, the higher the frequency, so the more dense the cellular network must be to support it. And that's not gonna work in regional and country settings. So um, hopefully that's uh, provided some, some advice or guidance on where 5G will be useful or not. Certainly the sub gigahertz bands, they're going to be valuable because they still have reasonable cell sizes, uh, particularly in regional areas where they're needed so much. So what that does, it puts a demand on that spectrum, that 450 up to 700 megahertz band spectrum, which is already used for digital TV, for DVB-T, for ISDB-T, for ATSC, they all operate in those bands. Now, as the spectrum in those bands uh, is assigned or available to telcos, they're going to start buying it up. And that's going to start to force, uh, or quite possibly, let's say, force um, TV broadcasters to reassess the use of VHF. VHF. So VHF band three is where DAB resides. Uh, and that's going to be coming under increasing pressure to be reused for television. So the, the, the message is quite clear. It's very valuable and really you know, get it while you can. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it can be a case of use it or lose it if you've already got it. But in newly developing, developing territories, 
it just goes to show that band three spectrum will definitely be something which is extremely valuable, if not for mobile services, for internet of things services. So uh, coming to conclusions, I'm running a bit late here, sorry. Um, DAB is definitely the most cost effective transmission system for radio. Uh, definitely very significant cost savings over FM. 5G will provide new contribution capability for broadcaster, for broadcasters particularly enabling rich multimedia, uh, something you increasingly see in vehicles before homes almost. 5G will not provide a cost effective distribution mechanism. Uh, it will offset some costs in streaming in cities, uh, but that's about it. It will not provide services in wide area rural situations. Uh, 5G, 4G IP will provide cost effective mechanisms for non critical hybrid multimedia content. Non critical. It's the add ons. And when I talked about hybrid before today, this is a great example of that. You can use 5G to deliver images to your web links, links to podcasts, uh, those sorts of activities, logos, strap lines, uh, and so forth. But the critical audio content, that's where broadcast and digital DAB plus broadcast is in a world of its own. Uh, and broadcasters really need to protect their VHE band three for DAB plus radio. If you haven't already done it, talk to, your, talk to your regulator about how you can do that. And as a conclusion here, I'll say that uh, hybrid DAB plus plus 5G is the most cost effective delivery of multimedia radio. Uh, something for the future, it's coming now. Radio broadcasters are total innovators and they will find ways to make the most of that uh, combination. So with that, I say thank you very much. Uh, and it would normally be a QA time here. However, we're almost 20 minutes over time. So uh, I think I will now just have to say uh, thank you for any questions you have, you have sent in. And we will uh, endeavor to answer them either tomorrow or on Thursday uh, after our sessions then. Uh, and on that note, I'll hand back to, uh, to Sri to um, to say thank you on behalf of ABU and thank you on behalf of World DAB to all who attended today. Thanks, over to you, Shri. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Les. So, um, so it was uh, excellent presentations. A uh, lot of speakers did about uh, the dev plus technology business cases, everything is very nice. Um, okay, this is the end of uh, day one and uh, tomorrow uh, we still have uh, uh, some more presentation on receivers and hidden systems. So please uh, join tomorrow as well. Um, uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, you all for your participation and I would like to thank all the speakers for the time and effort uh, during the presentation. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let's um, move towards closing the webinar session today. Uh, so today or tomorrow again, we'll come back in the same time, 12 p.m. KL time. Please join us there. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.